So suppose you write C as A times B, where A is a matrix of size M by K and B is a matrix of size K by N. Then one way to view this is in terms of an inner product, which um, uh, which we have seen in the previous in one of the previous classes already, but we'll also formally define it in a few minutes. But in a product. So suppose um, uh, I have A and B as vectors of the same length. then the inner product is defined as A transpose B, which is just a real number. Okay, then if I consider uh, AI transpose. Sir? Yeah? Sir, what is length of a vector? Length of a vector is the number of elements in it. Okay. So wouldn't it just be equal to the dimension? Like dimension, I can write that. Okay, yes, okay. No, but you are right in that we will momentarily define length of a vector also. Um, and so same same dimension or size is what I really meant here. Okay, so suppose AI is the i row of A and BI also in R power K is the jth column of A, uh, jth column of B. Hello, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, what is VECS in bracket ident? Vectors. Vectors, okay. Sir. So the ijth entry of the product AB is nothing but the inner product between the ith row of A and the jth column of B. So this is one way to view matrix multiplication. Every element of the product matrix is an inner product between a row of A and a column of B. The other uh, representation is the column representation. It should be sigma a i transpose bj. Hmm? Sigma there is no summation there. here. Yeah, so there is no summation here. This is the inner product representation. So if I have two matrices and I'm taking their product, recall that if you want the one comma one element of their product, you have to take the first row of this matrix, first column of this matrix, take their inner product and that gives you the one comma one element of this product. If I want the uh, say two comma three uh, uh, entry of this uh, of this product matrix, then I must take the second row and then the third column. So there is one yeah, more yeah. here, and then I take the inner product of the two red uh, vectors, and that gives me the two comma three entry. So this is called the inner product representation. The other thing is the column representation. So CJ if I define to be the jth column of C, okay, which is going to be in R to the M, then this is equal to summation I equal to 1 to K, AI, B, I, J. This is true for j equal to 1, 2, up to n. 
Okay, so each column of this matrix C is a linear combination of the columns of A. And what are the coefficients? They are given by Bij. The jth column of B gives you the coefficients of the linear combination that will form the jth column of C. Okay, so it's a linear combination. I repeat, it's a linear combination of the columns of A with the coefficients given by the jth column of B. And the third is the outer product representation. So we can also write the entire matrix C. So we are going from small to big. Here we looked at how to write an ijth entry of C, a single entry of C. This is for getting you a, an entire column of C. And this is a representation which will give you the entire matrix C itself. This is equal to summation K. No, I'll write it in terms of I. I equal to 1 through K. AI. BI transpose. So this is the ith column of A. And this is the ith row of B. Now, since uh, A is of size M by K, the ith column of A is of size M by 1, and the ith row of B is of size 1 by N. So when I take this outer product, I'll get an M by N matrix. And so the matrix C is the sum of K rank 1 matrices of size M by N. Okay, so now we, we, we move on to the inner product. Sir, what is A, I, and B? Like, column representation. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Sir, in column representation session, what is A, I in that summation, inside summation? Okay. These are the columns of A. And AI is the ith column of A. Then that summation then runs from A or 1 to M. Sir. 1 to, okay, so maybe just hold on one second. A is of size M by K. So A has K columns. Yeah, so the summation goes from 1 to K. So what is the question? There are k columns in the matrix A. A is of size m by k. A1 is the first column. A2 is the second column. AK is the kth column. Okay, so now I got it. Jth column of C belongs to R of M. The jth column of C is in R to the M, yes. But Every column of C is in Rm. C is of size M by column. M. Oh, sir. But it is written R to the power of M there. R to the power? M in column representation. No, CJ is the jth column of C. It is in R to the M. M. Uh, oh, R to the N. Okay, thank you. Sir. You are right. Yeah, each column is in R to the M. Okay, and there are n such columns. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, these things are a little tricky. Uh, it's good to uh, think about it independently. Um, yeah, but sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. So the usual inner product. So given two vectors x in 
c to the n and y in c to the n. So I'm using complex vectors here because uh, it's just the more the general definition. So the inner product between x and y is written like this and it is equal to y Hermitian x or it is defined as y Hermitian x and this is also called the dot product. So Hermitian is nothing but the conjugate transpose. So you take the transpose of y and then you take the complex conjugate of every entry. That is y Hermitian. y Hermitian inner product with or dot product with x is defined to be the inner product between x and y. There are other definitions possible, but we'll revisit that later in the course. Um, but this definition here, it satisfies two properties that I can immediately tell you. The first is that if I take alpha x1 plus beta x2 in a product with y, this is going to be equal to alpha in a product of x1 and y um, plus beta in a product of x2 with y. But if I take the inner product between x and alpha y1 plus beta y2, what will I get? A conjugate. x y1 plus beta star x y2. So it is linear in the first argument okay and it is conjugate linear in the second argument now we can immediately define orthogonality a set of vectors are said to be orthogonal if every pair of vectors in the set are orthogonal. Okay, so you take any two vectors, you take their inner product, you get zero. Then we say that um, if that happens for every pair of vectors in the set, we say that uh, the set of vectors are orthogonal. Now, um, one, uh, one inequality, very famous one related to the inner product is what? There's one very famous inequality associated with the inner product. Cauchy shorts. Exactly. So before I, I put down the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, let me just say one small thing. If I take square root of the inner product of x with itself, this is called the Euclidean length. Of x in c to the n. OK, and also it's also denoted by norm of x2. Now, um, if the inner product of x with itself is 1, then the vector x is said to be normalized. Or that uh, x is a unit vector. So basically, if I take uh, any vector x in C to the n, um, then x over square root of the inner product of x with itself is a unit vector. 
pointing in the direction of x. Sir? Yes, please. Sir, what is the subscript 2 in uh, the above statement? What does it mean? Can you take a guess? Um, sir, uh, in the product of two quantities? No. The so square you, root, it is square root, right? Yeah, no, not that. So the point is no. that uh, if you look at what this thing is doing, it's taking every entry of x, taking the mod square of it, adding that up across the entries, and then you're finally taking a square root. Okay, because you're taking the square of each of the entries and then eventually taking the square root, it is denoted by norm x2. So if, um, I mean, since you asked the question, I'll say that norm x p is going to be equal to Okay, so this is a definition of the what is called the p-norm of x. It's also known as the lp-norm. And it turns out it is a norm for p greater than or equal to 1. Okay, but I'll, uh, I haven't defined... I haven't defined what a norm is. So for now you take it on faith that if for any p greater than or equal to one, I can define norm xp to be this quantity here and it actually is a norm. So we'll study that uh, later. So there are other, other kinds of inner products and norms that you can define, which we will study later. But now I'm ready to state the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Sir, uh, I have a question. We cannot define zero norm, right? Because so you can you can define norm x p for p uh, p less than one, and you can get you can take p equals zero. You can even take negative p, but for p less than one, this will this norm x p will not be a norm. And uh, so I don't want to get into the details right now because I haven't defined norm yet. We will define it in one or two classes and then we can discuss these properties. Uh, but for now, um, I just want to relate it to this. Uh, somebody asked me why it is norm x2 here. And so I'm just answering that it is actually coming from a more general definition of the length of a vector, which can be defined like this. And uh, this is a valid definition of the length of a vector for p greater than or equal to 1. So let's not worry about what happens when p is less than 1 or equal to 0 or even negative just for the moment. We'll come back to that point later. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality simply says that the inner product between y and x in magnitude is less than or equal to the inner product between x and itself, power half, times the inner product between oh. y and itself, power half and with equality if and only if x and y are linearly dependent basically they point in the same direction so the proof is very quick so I'm just going to in the dying minutes of this class run through the proof all you do is uh, you start with noting that x in a product with x is always greater than or equal to 0 with equality if and only if x equals 0. Okay, the, as I wrote it here, you can see that the inner product of x with itself is the sum of the squares of the entries of x power 1 by 2. And so if this equals 0, the sum of the squares of the entries are, is 0 which is only possible if every one of these entries is zero. 
um, because they're all non-negative quantities. So now we'll take this uh, x minus lambda y in a product with itself. And this is uh, because I'm taking the inner product of a vector with itself and lambda is some scalar here. And uh, since it's the inner product of a vector with itself, this is always greater than or equal to zero with equality only if and only if x minus lambda y equals zero. So from this, you can already see that uh, the equality condition will only be satisfied if x equals lambda y so that this difference is zero, which means that x and y are linearly dependent. And this is true for every x, y belonging to c to the n and lambda belonging to c. So the, we just expand the left hand side. And if you expand it out, you will see ju you just have to take this Hermitian times this and expand it out. You will see that this is equal to x Hermitian x minus lambda x Hermitian y minus lambda star y Hermitian x plus mod lambda square y Hermitian y. Okay, now if y equals zero, then this inequality is trivially satisfied. Y x in a product is less than or equal to this times this. If y equals zero, the left hand side is zero, the right hand side is also equal to zero. And so this inequality is clear, is, is trivially satisfied. So, um, so I'll just say y equal to zero, the Cauchy-Schwartz is trivially satisfied. So assume y is not equal to zero. And in that case, I can choose lambda equal to y Hermitian x over y Hermitian y, which is equal to the inner product between x and y divided by the inner product between y and y. If I substitute this value of lambda here, you see that I get y Hermitian x times x Hermitian y, which is the same as mod of x Hermitian y squared divided by y Hermitian y. And this term is also y Hermitian, uh, the conjugate of y Hermitian x is nothing but x Hermitian y times y Hermitian x divided by y Hermitian y. So I'll just, and in, in, in this last case, I get mod of y Hermitian x squared and one of the y Hermitian y's will cancel and I'll be left with y Hermitian y in the denominator. So just writing it out, the, uh, the above becomes um, x Hermitian x, which stays as it is, minus x Hermitian y squared over y Hermitian y minus x Hermitian y squared over y Hermitian y plus x Hermitian y squared divided by y Hermitian y. So things I've used here, so this is greater than or equal to zero and these two terms obviously cancel and so which implies that x Hermitian x minus x Hermitian y squared over y Hermitian y is greater than or equal to zero from which the inequality follows. All I have to do is to take this to the other side, bring y Hermitian y to the top and then take the square root throughout. So I used a couple of things here. One is that x Hermitian y complex conjugate equals y Hermitian x, okay? Um, this is one, I guess this is the only side result that I use and uh, you can see that you can, um, this is not difficult to see. So you can see that this is true. Just write out what it is then. So just keep in mind that um, y Hermitian is equal to y transpose complex conjugate. Okay, so that's the proof of this inequality.
Okay, we'll stop here.